Welcome to the porch here on Firefall Talk Radio. I'm Richard Grund. This is where we get back to basics, the red letter basics. We study the Word of God, we focus on the Book of Acts Church, and we see how they serve the Lord. And we do that so that we can follow their example. By taking a deeper look into their service to the kingdom of God, we find the church the Lord intended and not the one that man created, and we can regain that world-shaking influence that they had. Excuse me. Still dealing with this insidious flu. Hold on a second. (coughs) Mute button didn't catch in time. I'm sorry. But you know what? Doesn't matter. We press on. We keep going. Church age is not over. And what happened in the upper room is as much for today as it was on the day of Pentecost. Come on here. I didn't sneeze the whole time I was waiting for the show to come on. All right, Satan. You've had your fun. We got something to do here. We got a session of the porch. We're going to talk about you being a loser. So what happened in the upper room, the fire falling, the power that came out of there, it's still available to us. And if you know that and you believe that and you want more in your spiritual walk with Yeshua, with Jesus, then you've come to the right place. If you have any questions, go to firefalltalkradio.com, use the contact button, or email us at the porch at firefalltalkradio.com. If you want to support what we do, and we hope that you would, and thank you to everyone that does, go to the bottom of the Firefall Talk Radio updated homepage. There are ways to do that. If you need more information, just let us know. We'll be glad to answer any questions. Welcome to all of our listeners on the various streaming platforms. Thank you for being a part of the porch. If you need anything, you want to pray for others, you want prayer, please let us know. Please contact us because we care about you. Subscribe to us on the various social media accounts we have, Facebook, Instagram, and X. Used to be Twitter. Now it's X. And uh, if you're a part of the aerial support, we could sure use your prayers. A lot going on, a lot, a lot of attacks. The enemy is very active, but we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And greater is he that is in me and with me than he that is in the world and against me. So we just keep going. We stand fast in the faith and the power of his name. All right, got the mute button in time. So we start out with praise reports and prayer requests. Praise him for his love, his grace, and his mercy, for the salvation that he's offered me, for my home, for my wife, my family, my furry kids, for everything that I have. Oops, sorry. I praise him for the dreams and the vision and everything that he has shown me. Oh, this is going to be an interesting one tonight. Buckle up, folks. For being a renewed spirit man, for being able to praise him, no matter what. Whether healthy, whether dealing with something, whether injured, whether it doesn't matter. We praise him because he is worthy of all praise. And I praise him that I believe he's getting ready to come back. Creation's groaning for the return of the king. I'm groaning. Some of you are too. We want to see Messiah. We want to see the sky split and for him to finish the work that he's begun. To see the coming kingdom and the new Jerusalem. Now let's pray. I pray for Israel and the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you, Jerusalem. Psalm 122, verses 6 through 8. So I continue to pray for the remaining Israeli hostages and the horrific stories that are still coming out, for the bodies that remain in Gaza. I pray for the suffering people of Gaza because of the tyranny and the actions and control of Hamas. pray the world would wake up and see what's really going on there and stop trying to limit Israel's ability to protect itself and to do what it needs to do for its existence. 
I pray for those that are hurting right now, for the loss of loved ones. A good friend of mine from New York for my days at the New York Health and Racquet Club, his brother died, and they, they've been playing in a band together since high school, and now they're in their 60s. And uh, So I pray for him. His name is Jeb. If you want to remember Jeb in, uh, in your prayers, that'd be great. But there are other people. I see it on social media. A lot of media, a lot of hurting people right now. A loss of loved ones, health problems, financial problems. Please, even if you don't know their names, throw a prayer up for that unknown person and let the Holy Spirit use it. I pray for the fatherless and the widows, the innocents, the martyrs, and the victims of injustice. Our brothers and sisters are suffering around the world, and soon it will come to America and the Western civilization. But as yet, we're protected. I pray for divine wholeness, health, and healing, especially right now in me, in my grandson, Jason, who's got this flu, and my wife and my family and everybody out there. You know what? We walk by faith and not by sight. Now, we pray together. We we agree with one another. And let's get back to our divine design. We have a job to do. We don't have time to be sick for protection, for inspiration, for the remnant. I pray for you to wake up, to rise up. Wake up others, and let's answer the call to action. Let's do what we have been called to do. If you've been blessed, be a blessing. We have needs, people have needs, and I'd like to be able to help those people in need. Let's get our combined prayers to put the enemy on the run. Let's get proactive instead of reactive. Dunamis-empowered, Holy Spirit, faith-filled prayers. Let's hit it, not like shotgunning in the sky, hoping you hit something, but let's get laser-like focus on the needs and on the enemy. Let's get a little more aggressive. Stop being victimized. Let's have confidence, purpose, and power in our prayers. For the Psalm 91 supernatural protection covering us during this incredibly dangerous time. I pray for edification, encouragement, inspiration for me and for you that we can operate efficiently in the calling, exposing the enemy, seeking the lost, helping the dying, and those in bondage, and destroying the works of the enemy, setting the captives free. Father, you are awesome. Awesome. Amazing. We ask right now, Lord, that I know you hear us, but we're all coming together as one, whether live or In recording, they're listening, and at a later date, they can agree with me to tell you how awesome you are. You sent Yeshua to die for us, and Yeshua did it. He paid the price. He hung on the cross, shed the blood, became the perfect Lamb of God. You sent back the Holy Spirit to teach us and to walk with us, encourage us, empower us. We thank you right now. We ask for a touch. We ask you to reach down and touch us. Stir up the spirit within us. Restore us, Lord. Restore us, restore us, restore us. Let your glory fall. Surround us. Drive away the darkness so that we can be what you need us to be in this time. We love you, and we thank you, and we praise you, and we say do whatever you will And whatever you want to do this night on the porch. And I pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Lessons are proprietary information, except where noted the information comes from outside sources. The combination of that information, the matter presented, is exclusive, cannot be repeated or used without permission. The date of this broadcast serves as the registered date of the following information. Dr. Martin Luther King, from his 1963 book, Strength to Love, says, Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. So 
So let's get those Bibles open. Let's continue on the journey that we started for 2024. As we talked about last week, the nighttime is increasing. It's getting darkness, a demonic darkness that is worse and going to get worse until the day of the Lord approaches and appears. We need to prepare to see it and to meet it, to be ready for it, shining and ready. Romans 13, starting verse 11, says, And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We established last week that when the day is at hand, it's light time. And if you don't know what I mean, you haven't listened to last week's Bible study, and you should. Therefore, tonight, We must get back to when we experienced first light. What is first light? According to Merriam's Webster's Dictionary, it's the time when light is first seen in the morning, at dawn, the moment when the sun can first be seen on the horizon, that, you know, that range of perception or experience, something that is is out there and it's going to be attained. You set off on a journey, you set off at first light. What reminded me of a song called At the Cross by Isaac Watts and Ralph E. Hudson from 1885. And I'm just going to tell you the chorus. The chorus is, and I know you know it, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. At the cross is where his light broke through my darkness and drove it away. The dawn of a new day, living in the light, living in his light. It was then that I began to absorb his glory into my soul and began to shine. There are two ways to shine, to either be the source of the light or a reflection of it. Every lamp is different, but the light is the same. John 1, starting verse 4. The Word, that's Yeshua, gave life life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. In Him, Yeshua, was life, the power to bestow life, and that life was the light of men. And the light of the Lord shines on in the darkness. And the darkness did not understand it, overpower it, or appropriate or absorb it. Jesus, the light of the world. He said so. John eight twelve. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. But then later in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, speaking to his disciples and therefore to us, he says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light light to everyone in the house. Well, how can that be, Lord? You said you out of the light of the world, and now we're the light of the world, but that's because you're in us through your Holy Spirit. Fulfilling your promise in John twelve forty six, when you said, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world, so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. If someone is in darkness, they're there by choice. But the only one that can do this 
is him. He alone can do this. No man, no religion, no idol, only Messiah and the cross. The cross is the beacon drawing all people to him, guiding their way to salvation. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Messiah, Yeshua. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message that God gave to the world at just the right time. He's a mediator. He's a middle person to reconcile two parties at enmity to bring peace. Those two parties are God and mankind. The Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary says, Mediator, the claims and the needs can only be met by one who, himself being proved sinless, would offer himself as a sacrifice, as a payment on behalf of men. One who acts as a guarantee so as to secure something which otherwise would not be obtained. He's the only one that can do it. Hebrews 8, 6, but now he, capital H, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. I don't understand how people can go back to the law when they've been given a freedom in Yeshua. Hebrews 9, 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal, eternal inheritance. See, Messiah is the surety of the better covenant, the new covenant, guaranteeing its terms for his people. And I'm thankful for that. Satan owned me completely. He had legal right to me while I was in my sins. But the blood of the Lord, the blood of the Lamb, washed that away and broke that legal hold on me. So he paid for my sins with the Father. He broke the chains. He set me free. In Mark 10, 45, he says that he gave his life as a ransom for many. They came to serve by giving up his life. He's a payment for the redemption of a captive in exchange for one person for another. He took our place on the cross. He shed his blood so that we wouldn't have to shed ours. The redemption of a life for life. That was the law. That was what the Father demanded. Titus 2.11-14 through 14 says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus the Messiah, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We're special to him, and we're a special people in a world that is fallen under the control of the evil one, but we're in this world, but we're not of this world. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews nine twelve. This all goes back to the cross. That's where first light begins. At the cross, at the cross, where we first saw the light. He gave his life. He gave it. No one took it. He says in John ten eighteen, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. 
Yeshua didn't just die. He died with power and authority. His life wasn't taken from him. He willingly laid it down for our sins. We we got to stop the nonsense of the anti-Semitic well blaming the Jews. They took his life. No, no, no. He laid it down. And let's get real here. The, the, the Gentiles participated. The Romans participated. Jew and Gentile participated in his execution. But the fact still remains he could have stopped it. He didn't have to do it. But to the world and even to the enemy, his, his crucifixion was an apparent defeat. But instead, he flipped it and turned it into a lasting defeat for the evil one who sought to use his death to win a victory over God. You know, as I sit here, I've been dealing with this, whatever this is, for three weeks now. One week I had it, last week I was good, now it's back. And that's just the way it plays out sometimes. Last time that happened to me was December of 2019 when I think I had the first strand of, you know, that uh, C thing with the number. It doesn't matter. I know who I belong to. I know I'm in this world, not of this world, but every now and then we're going to take a shot. We're going to take a hit. We're going to get bruised. That's what warfare is like. And anyone who tells you otherwise is preaching from a different book. No one could take his life. He gave it up willingly to save us and to purchase us from death. The cross is God's power demonstrated in humanity's worst form, and it's for our glory. He did it for us. He didn't do it for him. He did it for us. 1 John three sixteen and 17, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and see his brother and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? God's love is contagious and needs to be spread, whether through actions or word or emotion. And the cross brings his love, which brings service to others out of our gratitude and love for him. But never forget the cross. He laid down his life by choice for you, for me. I'll never forget that. I'll never let go of that. I'll never let that thought escape my mind. I can't look at any depiction of the crucifixion without taking it personally, knowing that he did that for me. I never would have been able to withstand that kind of pain, and I have an extremely high pain tolerance. But the beatings and the scourging and the things they did to him even before they nailed him to a piece of wood. Most people die before they even get there, and they die quickly. For him to live as long enough on that cross that he did, they were shocked, and then if they live too long, they break their, their legs so they can't breathe, but no bone would be broken according with prophecy. Hebrews twelve one and 2, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This huge crowd of witnesses going back to his time to now, to a life of faith, Let's look at that. Let's strip off all these nonsense things that weigh us down, that slow us down, that sin, that besetting sin that so easily trips us up. And let's run. Let's run this race with endurance because he has set it before us. And we do this by keeping our eyes on him, 
on Yeshua, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And he did it because of the joy that awaited him. He endured the cross. He disregarded the shame. And then he sat down at a place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. And then you won't become weary. You won't give up. Because of the joy awaiting him. What joy? The joy he got from your freedom. From eternal separation from the Father. The joy he got of restoring you in right relationship to the Father who desperately wanted it. The joy of your new life and watching you walk in it. And most of all, I believe, the joy of his intimate relationship with you. First light, as powerful as it is for us, it's more so for him. He remembers the price he paid to have you, to have me. So when darkness overwhelms and makes you want to quit, just remember the ransom that was paid for you. And think of those who are waiting to be rescued. See, you can't rescue them. You can't help them. You may think, oh, I healed so-and-so. No, you didn't. You were just a vessel. You were just somebody the Lord used. You're not all that. Don't ever think that. The minute you begin to think you're something, you become nothing. The ransom, the redeeming price of man. He redeemed us from death. He redeemed us from sickness. He redeemed us from sin. He redeemed us from the diabolical enemy that is always trying to destroy us and to destroy him. Sin is tied to the cross. The cross exposes it. It removes it, and it replaces it. See, at the cross, we see our sins and are convicted. At the cross, we see his price, the love and the commitment it took for him to pay it. At the cross, the first light of freedom rolls over us, awakening our soul. I've told this story, but it was so powerful. I kneeled down at that altar in darkness, in shadows, and I made him Lord of my life and stood up. And everybody in that sanctuary thought they hit me with the spotlight from up in the cupola, but there was no spotlight. That was his light because I was no longer in darkness. The first light of freedom of the dawn of my new day was shining. That love and commitment to him is the spark to the fire that drives us. Like one of those old steam engine trains where the fire needs to be stoked and kept going so the train can roll. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit burning in us to keep going. It must be fed. It must be nurtured. A light needs power. And the fire of the Holy Spirit reveals the cross and its power, no matter how dark it is. Don't think you can't show somebody the cross. You can. You just got to be willing. You have to be willing to see it acknowledge it, accept what was done on it. Don't shun it. Don't be like those churches. I don't know if they're still around. They probably are. Oh, we we don't talk about the blood. We don't talk about the cross. That's a little too gory. We don't want to frighten anybody away. Well, then you don't know him. You don't belong to him. Good thing he wasn't frightened. A lot of phonies and fakes out there. And if they won't acknowledge the cross and the blood that was shed on it, I don't want to know them. Because at the cross, we get reminded of who we were as well as who we are now. The cross is where the old Richard died and the new Richard was born again. And by knowing that and telling that story, it gives hope to others. 
who have no hope. So my question is, where is that hope today? And why don't we talk about the cross? Why don't we acknowledge what he did? Oh, yes, we do it on, you know, that period of the year that we talk about it. You know, some of you call it Easter. I won't I won't use that term. It's Resurrection Sunday. But where is that hope? See, the world and the enemy don't want us to talk about it. It's dangerous to them. Oh, they'll say, shut up. We're going to arrest you. We're going to give you tickets. We're going to put you in jail. That's because, like 1 Corinthians one eighteen, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, in their natural dark minds, the story and the message of the cross is sheer absurdity. But, of course, it would be. It would be folly if they're perishing and on their way to perdition. But those of us who are being saved, it is the manifestation of the power of God. The cross, the cross of Messiah, and the gospel, his good news, is foolishness to those who are perishing under the control of the fallen one. See, the message of the cross and the one who was nailed to it, it's the core to what I believe. It's the core to what we believe. You can't have his message without it. But a world enveloped in darkness from the kingdom of darkness will refuse the message. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You got to keep you got to keep telling the story. You have to keep shining in the light. That's what Paul was saying to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 starting with verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and under Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, will heap up for themselves teachers, and those and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. But you he says, Timothy, be watchful in all things. It endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelist of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. First light is beautiful to see when it comes up on the horizon. But it's the sign. It's the sign of setting off on a new mission, on a new journey. And you set off at first light because the darkness is fading and we can go. Psalm 18, 28, for you, capital Y, will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Psalm 107, starting verse 10, some dwelt in darkness and in the deep deathly darkness, prisoners bound in misery and chains because they had rebelled against the precepts of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he humbled their heart with hard labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the deep, deathly darkness and broke their bonds apart. That was me. Oh, I know he's talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness and dealing with Pharaoh and being set free. But no, no, no. In Psalm 107, verses 10 through 14, he's talking about me. I lived in that darkness. I was a prisoner bound in misery and chains. I just didn't know it because I had rebelled against the precepts, the laws of God, and I had spurred the counsel, spurned it, cast it away, didn't want to hear it of the Most High, so he had to humble me. He let me stumble so that no one natural could help me. And even though I didn't admit it, I knew. 
I knew. And at that altar, I cried out, I need a Savior. And he saved me from my distresses. He broke me out of the darkness and broke the bonds apart. All the chains, all the shackles, everything that Satan had covertly put upon me were broken. The cross breaks every chain. And let's get honest here. Satan doesn't like his prisons opened and people set free. No, he he hates it. And if he can't take out his anger on you, he'll take it out on the underlings that failed in their mission. But he'll take it out on somebody. Because he will do whatever it takes to keep people in darkness with no hope of first light. And that's why you're so important. So do this. Do what I'm talking about. Knowing that this time is a critical time. It's already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep of spiritual complacency. For our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed in Messiah. The night, this present evil age, is almost gone. And the day of Messiah's return is almost here. So let us fling away the works of darkness, and put on the full armor of light. What do you need to fling away? If you ask the Holy Spirit, he'll tell you. What do you need to fling away that keeps darkness nearby? But understand this, that these last days that we're in, Perilous times and of great stress and trouble have set in. Times that are hard to deal with and hard to bear. For people will be and are lovers of self, utterly self-centered, lovers of money, aroused by an inordinate greedy desire for wealth, proud and arrogant, contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. They'll be without natural human affection, although they'll be callous and inhuman, relentless, admitting of no truce or appeasement. They'll be slanderers, false accusers and troublemakers, intemperate, loose morals, oh my goodness, and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce haters of good, They'll be treacherous, betrayers, rash, and inflated with self-conceit. They'll be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than the, and rather than lovers of God. For although they hold to a form of piety, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. These words are being spoken to the church. And Paul ends his word to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Avoid all such people. Turn away from them. The church is filled with people like I just described. That's why you got to go back to the cross. The battle about the cross is the battle between the heart and the mind. It's the battle between the two trees in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. I'm not saying knowledge is wrong. It's not wrong if it's meant to enhance your walk and your relationship with him. However, when knowledge becomes the end goal, we wind up disconnected from the simplicity of the cross's power. That's the warfare. You can't pull down any strongholds of the enemy until you deal with the strongholds of the mind. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Messiah. 
We are destroying when we preach the gospel and talk about the cross, the blood, the empty tomb, and the upper room. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that has set itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Messiah. The enemy will gladly trap you in your mind, in your thoughts, in that gnosis that leads you away from him to keep your heart disengaged. As long as he can keep you in your mind, your heart is not connected. So arguing about things that have no eternal value is a complete and utter waste of time. I used to do that. I was very much like Paul at the beginning, arguing over everything, proving the point, proving them wrong. It solved nothing. Nope. I have no time for that anymore. All these different things going on in the world, all the different conspiracies, they're distractions. You're fighting windmills. What does it do for others? What does it do for the kingdom? Remember that when you get caught up in social media and all that's going on there, all that's going on in the world, this is happening, this political thing, oh, they're lying here, they're stealing there. Yeah, guess what? It's a fallen world system that is rigged to do those things. And we can pray for God to intervene, but it doesn't mean he will. But we shouldn't focus on them so much. We're dealing with things that have no eternal value. Get back to the cross. Get back to that moment of first light when the dawn of your spiritual life began to rise and the darkness faded away and you were a new person, a new creation. Now you may say, well, I don't I don't remember that moment. Well, find it. Try to remember it. Ask the Holy Spirit for it because it is vital to know where you've come from to remember that moment. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says for it is the God it is God who commanded the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus the Messiah Yeshua. He commanded the light out of the darkness and into our lives through his Son. He literally said, as I knelt on that altar and made Yeshua Lord of my life, let light shine out of the darkness. Shine my light into his heart. And that light was the knowledge of the glory and the majesty of a God clearly revealed to me through the face of his Son, through the face of Messiah. The first light of the darkness in my life and for all of us comes from the sun of his glory. See, if you remember what you were like before that moment, then the transformation is so much more powerful and empowering to you in in your desire to serve him. I know, I remember what I was like. I don't remember all the bad things I did. He kind of wiped them from my brain, but I remember what I did, the people I hurt. I can't undo that. I wish I could, but I can't. But I can use it to motivate me, to help set others free. But you got to stir it up. You got to keep it alive. In Revelation 3, starting verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? And this Lord speaking. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your words perfect 
before God. Your works perfect before God. Let me say that again. I don't want you to miss it. This is the Lord speaking to the church in Sardis. He's calling them a dead church. I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, you will not watch. I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He's saying you're not dead yet. But if you don't change, you will be. And you'll be separated from me. There are a few that haven't. The remnant within you hasn't. But you've been called to life and into light. Repent. Change. That word repent is, is you're doing a 180. You're going in the opposite, opposite direction away from the things you were doing wrong. Hold on to the fact that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2, 9. See, you're not like them. You're not like them in the world. You're a chosen people, royal priest, the holy nation, God's own people possession. And as a result of that, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Not man's, not the church's, not in denominations. It's in his wonderful light. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. How did he do that? He did it with the cross. That's what he did to me on that day on October 9th, 1988. He delivered me from the power of darkness. He snatched me out of that kingdom, right into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And the cross was the key to my deliverance, the key to my freedom. That's the key to everything. Oh, it's great that you want to be spirit-filled. It's great that you want to be involved in signs and wonders. It's great that you want to do deliverances and cast out demons, do all that other stuff. But the cross is the key to your deliverance and is every part of your life in submission to him. Because if the enemy has any part of your life, if there's any speck of the enemy left inside of you, he's going to sneak in at a moment when you're not paying attention, and take you down. Get before the Lord. Get before the Holy Spirit and say to him like David did in the Psalms, search me. If there's any unclean thing in me, remove it. Burn it out of me. Show it to me so I can repent. I posted a meme under the SRT um, Instagram and uh, Facebook. And what I said was, if you won't accept godly correction, you will accept demonic deception. Because if you can't be corrected, if you can't listen when somebody gives you a clear godly word, then the enemy will deceive you. And if you say to me, I can't be deceived, you're already deceived. There's going to be a time when if he didn't cut the time short, even the elect would be deceived. Satan got a third of the angels to walk away from eternity, to walk away from glory, to follow him. Don't think he can't deceive you. Don't think he can't make his voice sound like the Lord. He can, and he does. So how do you know? How would you know that it wasn't him if it sounded so much like him? 
kind of like what they can do now with the AI spoofing. They can uh, create somebody's voice. Well, if that voice says something to me that doesn't line up with the word or doesn't line up with his nature, I know it can't be him. The first light takes place at the cross. That time when the light first appears in the morning, at the dawn, and you're about to set off on a journey, you do it at first light. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters as well as myself that we're in a time of incredible deception and darkness. We're in a time where people are one degree off, not realizing how far away they are from their destination. Please, in your grace and your mercy, show them, correct them, give them a course correction. Shine your glory upon them. Shine it upon us now, even as we are here together on the porch. Open our eyes. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Open our hearts. Burn off of us all the dross and the sin and the heaviness of this world and of our poor decisions and of our compromise. Burn away the, the, the yeast of, of compromise that comes into a religious life and let us walk in the freedom of the Spirit. Help us to get back to basics. Help us get back to a place where we can see the cross on the horizon. You said if you were lifted up, you would draw all people to you. And Lord, I pray that we never get in the way of their sight line, that we never cause them to look at us before they look at you. Because I know what you'll do, everybody that's ever done that, You've knocked them down to get them out of the way. You've knocked them off the pulpits. You've knocked them off the stages. You've knocked them off the pedestals. Because you're the only thing worth seeing. You're that beacon that draws us out of the darkness, out of the rough seas, before we crash on the rocks. There can be nothing in the way of you. As this darkness rages and the enemy doing what it's doing with the ferocity and an arrogance that I have never seen before, let us stand fast in the faith and the power of your name. Let us never forget the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the cross, setting the captives free, healing the sick, the dying drawing them back to you. Lord, let this word go forth tonight. Let it do what you purposed it to do and not return void as your promises are. For we're in a time of darkness that we need this light. We need you. And I pray all these things In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord Adonai make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, give you shalom. I'm Richard Grund. This has been The Porch on Firefall Talk Radio.